Hello and welcome to another Royal Society publishing video podcast. Today I'm with guest editors Tom Hartley and Colin Lieber to talk about their recent Trans B issue on space in the brain. Can you first of all tell us what you mean by the term space in the brain? So um, we're really thinking about the way in which the brain represents and processes information about where you are or what direction you're heading in. So there are lots of different ways in which the brain represents spatial information of one kind or another. For example, um, right now I'm aware of the distance between you and I and, and the direction that you are relative to my head and my face. And that's one kind of spatial representation. But we're really focusing in this special issue on how we know where we are in the world and what direction we're heading in, how we find our way around the kinds of representations that allow us to uh, recognise a place, but why do we sometimes get lost, that kind of thing. I suppose we're, we're thinking of a map-like representation of space and um, the way in which different cells in the brain support that map-like representation. One of the things that became very apparent is that there's an increasing amount of integration between the different levels at which space in the brain is being studied. Um, and we really wanted to get together all of the experts who are working on this in, in different ways, using different techniques, and to discuss the, the really current work that was happening in this area. This special issue focuses on the hippocampal formation and the regions of the brain that it um, interacts with most closely. We aren't focused in this issue on, say, parietal cortex and frontal cortex, which are also involved in um, spatial cognition and behaviour. Um, the focus here is very much on the hippocampal formation, so it's selective in that sense. Can you tell us about the different types of space cells that are found in the brain? So we think there are at least four types of fundamental spatial cell. Um, in order of their discovery, they are place cells, head direction cells, grid cells, and boundary cells. Place cells seem to signal um, where you are in the world, but they are encoded in a kind of context-selective way. So a particular cell might fire um, in the southeast region of one room, but maybe not at all in, an, in another room. So what we've got here is, if, if you think about this as, as a small room, um, actually, the, uh, the animal, a rat in this case, is running around the environment. It's picking up food in all different directions. So it's seeing a very different view of the environment all the time. But every time uh, it runs through this particular part of the environment, called the place field, this cell fires. So it sends out an action potential, or it signals to the rest of the rat's brain, if you like, that's where it is. Head direction cells are kind of like the brain's compass. Each individual cell signals a particular head direction, um, which might be, say, northeast. Obviously, uh, a human being or a rat doesn't necessarily think that direction is northeast, but also, or so on. Um, and other head direction cells will signal uh, different directions, so that together the whole 360 degrees are covered. Grid cells are a kind of cell which seem to divide space up into equal, equal um, portions. Now here, when the rat is running around in its environment, the cell doesn't fire just at one place, it fires at lots of different locations around in the environment. But what's fascinating about these cells uh, is that when you actually look at the firing rate in the different parts of the environment, which is shown here, so the brighter colours indicate places in the environment where the cell fires more strongly, these peaks in the firing rate form this kind of regular pattern so throughout the room, if you like, there are these regularly spaced peaks. They're, they form equilateral triangles. The size and the shape and the orientation of these grids is really interesting. It's a really interesting novel way of encoding space that really was not anticipated at all before these cells were discovered. Boundary cells signal space in relation to external cues outside the subject. And they fire, um, say, a cell might fire whenever um, the uh, human or animal encounters a boundary, say, a metre to the south of, of them, and so on. These um, kinds of cells, the place cells, the head direction cells, the grid cells, and the boundary cells, together kind of tell us where we are in the world. Um, the signals that they provide give the rest of the brain a kind of code for space. Can you briefly describe some of the techniques that are used to investigate spatial cognition? So going back to the 1970s, place cells were first discovered uh, by uh, recording 
uh, what cells in the rat's brain did as an animal's scampering around in the environment. So the ant animal will be um, uh, exploring uh, a box in the lab uh, and being given uh, little pieces of food every now and then. So it's running all around its environment. And what's happening is that the uh, uh, electrodes are near to these individual cells and are able to record the electrical signals that they're giving out. Um, and uh, as a given, uh, as the animal runs through a certain part of its environment, uh, those, a given cell would start firing at a particular place in the environment, and each different cell would fire in a different place. Um, and that technique is called extracellular single unit recording. And more recently, it's been developed so that many, many cells can be recorded from at the same time. But many new methods have now come on stream uh, that allow us to uh, record and manipulate cells uh, in different parts of the brain, but also potentially to um, record from cells in the human brain. So for example, it's now possible to use similar techniques in patients who are undergoing surgery for epilepsy. So those kind of patients, um, they have to have electrodes implanted in their brain as part of their treatment. The doctors want to know which part of the brain is generating this epileptic seizure. Um, and so at the same time, they're beginning to record from the activity of single units in those parts of the brain. And what they find is the same kinds of cells, the place cells, the grid cells. So there is some uh, sense in which um, human beings uh, have these very same cellular representations. Now what's interesting is the way that these then connect to the other kinds of techniques that we can use. So at the finer scale, um, it's possible to record from uh, an individual cell in much greater detail so that you can see the electrical activity within an identifiable particular cell um, and how it reacts um, without necessarily sending out a signal to other cells but at this sort of sub-threshold level which can be very informative. But at a greater level we can use techniques like functional magnetic resonance imaging in human beings to look at how uh, the overall activity in different parts of the brain uh, re relates to our behaviour in complex tasks like navigating around uh, an, uh, an environment, taking a, an object from place A to place B um, and that kind of thing. So what we're seeing in our field now, and it's probably quite special to spatial cognition, is almost a complete connection between the very finest levels of, of neuroscience, even down to the molecular level, um, and then going right up through uh, looking at individual neurons in animals' brains, in human brains, um, and using brain imaging and even psychological techniques to begin to understand how this whole process works and how it manifests itself in complicated behaviours. Why, why do we sometimes get lost? How do we find our way from A to B? That type of thing. And how do animal models relate to human behaviour? Well, we, we definitely feel that um, one of the really exciting things about working in our field is the insights that we, we seem to get from rodents translate very well um, to humans. So, for example, um, place cells were first discovered in rodents. We now, we, we now know from um, recording inside the, the human hippocampal formation that there are place cells uh, in the human hippocampus, and that's using virtual reality. Um, We've seen um, using, of course, fMRI that the, hippocamp the hippocampal formation is really important in navigation just as it is um, in rodents and indeed other, other um, animal species. Grid cells were first discovered in rodents and they've now been shown, a recent paper um, is showing that they are in, um, in humans too, in, in the entorhinal cortex in the same region uh, of the brain that's been shown in where grid cells have been shown in rodents. So we're hoping that um, by understanding how um, the hippocampal formation encodes spatial information, we'll get some insights into how we can detect its proper correct function and when it goes wrong. And so um, this connection all the way through from the molecular level uh, to the behavioural and the cognitive level could turn out to be really important. And I think one of the reasons why spatial cognition is so important for this is because the kinds of complex behaviour that we're talking about and even the idea of cognition is something that's very difficult to normally to study in animals or at the level of synapses and individual cells. But here in spatial cognition, perhaps it's the case that what human beings do isn't so far removed from what other uh, animals do. And certainly the parts of the brain that seem to be involved in this system uh, are preserved across evolution and across a wide variety of mammalian species. So we think that what we're looking for is really quite general. 
and that the uh, insights that we gain into these mechanisms might have applications not just in spatial cognition but to cognition more generally. How do you think future work will evolve the field? Well, there are, there are so many I interesting things, but we're going to have massive probes such that you'll be able to record from hundreds, perhaps even thousands of cells at a time. And I think that's going to address the issue about the interaction between different um, fundamental types of spatial cell, the interactions between different regions, um, and also be able to essentially look at network properties um, and so answer questions um, that are able to address computational models of interactions and so forth. Um, I think that's going to be important. One of the nice things about working on this field, it's, it's a fundamental interest. Uh, the, um, the, the fundamental neuroscience is very interesting. You know, understanding how we, human beings or animals, know where we are, how we get from A to B, is, of course, fascinating. But one of the reasons why we're so interested in the hippocampal formation is because it's one of the first parts of the brain that goes wrong in Alzheimer's disease. So part of the motivation for studying this part of the brain and understanding its function so closely is that if we understand its function better, we hope that we'll be able to devise, for example, behavioral tests that will reveal uh, problems with the hippocampus, perhaps before they're manifesting themselves in the form of dementia. What for me is most fascinating is to see how uh, the systems that we understand from fundamental neuroscience uh, are generalised in human beings and how those predict and explain, account for complicated behaviours like finding your way around in the world. Is it going to be possible in the future perhaps to manipulate the formation of new memories, to turn on new memories or turn off new memories? Um, is it going to be possible to use some of the knowledge that we're gaining about spatial cognition to diagnose and treat uh, disorders of the hippocampal formation which are a very important health problem for our society. Thank you very much and thank you for watching.